on Overcomers International, and today I have a very special guest. Roberts Lairdon is joining me on the program. Roberts, welcome. It's good to be with you, and I'm going to have a great time today. Thank you. And Roberts is an author. He's a public speaker, a spiritual leader, a church historian, and a humanitarian. He was born in Tulsa, Oklahoma. He was the first male child at Oral Roberts University, and he's one of the most well-known Christian authors and orators of the 20th and the 21st century. To date, he's sold over 7 million books worldwide, been translated into more than 50 languages, and is known internationally, having ministered in over 112 countries. So, Robert, let's talk about when you were born, your mom was attending Oral Roberts University. So talk about how you received both your first and your middle name. All right. Well, my uh, grandparents were ministers in the Carolinas, and they built about 23 churches, and they had five children. And so when my mother, which was the baby of the girls, uh, decided to go to university, there was no Christian university. And so a lot of people back in those days in the early 1900s didn't like their children going to non-Christian universities because if you did, most of the time they came back not believing what you taught them as as parents or what the pastor taught them in church. And so uh, Or Roberts in 1965 opened up his university in Tulsa, Oklahoma, which was the first charismatic-based a Christian university of its kind in the world, and my mother had applied to go there the first year along with my father. And so they were charter class members of Oral Roberts University. So the founders, Oral Roberts and his wife, Evelyn, wanted to help name the first baby boy and the first baby girl that the students would have. So my parents had the first baby boy, which was me. And so Oral and Evelyn and my mom and dad got together, and they named me Kenneth after my father, and my middle name, Roberts, after Oral Roberts' surname, and my last name, Lairdon. So I've spent almost 50 years explaining why my name has an S to it. So to say Robert, it's Roberts, and that's how I got my name, and, and I'm very proud to have it. Tell us about what happened to you when you were age 8. Well, I had a very uh, wonderful and probably an unusual experience for most people. I've jokingly said that I had a round-trip ticket to heaven and back because most folks get a one-way ticket to go there when they finish their earth work and they die and they go to heaven. But for some reason, I got to go to heaven and see a little part of it and come back. And so that's kind of what happened when I was eight years old. I had that special trip to heaven. So when you went to heaven, I've heard you tell about the experience when the day that Jesus became your friend. Would you share that with the listeners? Well, when I went to heaven for that short time, uh, we saw, you know, I, I can tell a lot, a lot about heaven, uh, but the part that you're asking is is a time that when I felt, as a little boy, I was eight years old, and uh, I was following Jesus, and he stepped into what the Bible calls the river of life. And there's only one river that we know of in heaven, but it has many tributaries that goes through heaven. So when you get in the river of life, the the liquid life does not go around your legs or your body. It goes through you. So you can feel the energy or the life of it coming up inside of you. And so Jesus walked into the river of life, and I followed him as a little boy. And in a few moments, he turned around and kind of pushed me under the water, and we had a water fight in the river of life. And when I came out from under being splashed or, you know, played in the water, I splashed Jesus back, and so we had a water fight in the river of life. And so I get more complaints and more emails going, how dare you splash Jesus? And I've always responded, he started it, and I just responded. So that for me as a little boy, I wasn't a theologian, I wasn't an adult man, I was a little boy. I was eight years old. And when Jesus did that to me, that communicated to me, and that moved in my heart to where this person named Jesus was not just this T or God figure. He also wanted to be my friend. And that's the day that Jesus became my friend. And so that's probably out of everything that I saw in heaven, and I saw angels, and I saw homes, and I saw all kinds of little things in heaven. That, to me, is the most important part of my special visit to heaven. 
And that kind of breaks a lot of uh, theological doctrine, doesn't it, of how Jesus would be? Um, and he, when you ex- when you talk about that on your video, it it makes me cry because it it moves me so much. Of you know how tender and how just how loving Jesus was towards you. Well, many times people only see Jesus as a theological figure. They don't see him as a compassionate person. They don't know him as a touchable friend. And if Christ would have came across to me as a little boy as this untouchable, elitist type of person, I would not have probably followed him. I would have probably not even reacted. But since he knew what and how to communicate to a little boy, and that was called playing in the river of life, having a water fight, that to me has made him real made it honest and made it uh, work for me in my heart. And so and I'm 48 years old today and that is probably still the most important thing that happened to me in heaven. And that probably set your life on course for the direction that God had for you. It did help me know which way I was supposed to go. Even though a lot of times you think because you had a vision of heaven or somebody saw you know some type of spiritual event, uh, you still have to make a quality decision to pursue it. Uh, in your life Uh, those things help they inspire you they encourage you but like I've always said you have to still make the decision uh, to do that which is right according to your life I have to make that quality mental and heartfelt decision I'm going to go this direction so I don't want people to think that that because I had that vision of heaven and that trip to heaven that uh, everything's been easy and everything was just wonderful but you still have that memory that encourages you, but then you've got to make the decision to follow it through every day of your life. I I found a couple other things um, really interesting, too, that were maybe a little surprising, and and it shouldn't be, but one of the things you said, too, is when you're in heaven, you still have your same personality, and I think sometimes you think, oh, you're going to change and be this super spiritual person, and you, you you won't be the same anymore, but you said, you know, like, us as humans, like we talk a lot, but the angels are kind of like they don't say too much, you know. They're there and their presence is known. Talk about that just a little bit. Well, when you're in heaven, when I was in heaven, all the people I saw looked like they were in their 30s. And uh, you could tell the difference between people and angels because angels are a little taller and some have wings and some don't. And the people there were about normal, what I call normal earth height, and they all looked like they were in their 30s. There was no one that was, like, overweight. There was no one that had handicaps. They were all in a, I guess, a beautiful 30-year-old type-looking people. And they all had different personalities. They weren't all the same. They weren't all little dwarfs of this little controlled mindset. Everybody had their look. And when you're in heaven, you are the way you look on earth, except for there's no problems or blemishes or difficulties and there's no aging so everybody looks like they're in their 30s and everybody has their own personality and most people don't realize that in heaven there's no negative uh things coming at you one of the the things i miss the most about heaven is being in an atmosphere where there's no negative being thrown at you or being pulled on you or reminds you of anything negative it's a positive loving lifting atmosphere And to me, that is one of the most wonderful things about heaven is to be in an atmosphere where there's no negative and no bombs being thrown at you, where you don't have to live on a guard. So people are happier. They're freer. They're not Mm -hmm. uh, self-conscious. They are more outgoing of themselves. So heaven is a place where people are free and happy, and they're not oppressed. They're not embarrassed. There's no inferiority. And so it is a wonderful place to go. I I love it that you share about your experience because I think it just encourages the body of Christ so much and it helps us to really know, you know, who Jesus is. I just love that. So you wrote a book about your experience and it sold how many copies so far? The first book that I wrote is called I Saw Heaven and it's the testimony of what I'm talking about and there's a lot more that I didn't share here today on the radio uh, about it. So I put it in a book. And I wrote it when I was 17 years old, and I sold a million and a half copies of it in English. Now, it's in all other kinds of languages now, but we have at least a million and a half copies of English that we are aware of. Well, stay tuned. We're going to be right back with more from Robert Lairdon. 
We're back, and we're talking with Roberts Lairdon, and Roberts has been sharing with us about an experience he had when he was eight years old, and at age eight, he went to heaven, and Jesus became his friend in heaven. He had a water fight with Jesus in the river of life, and that was the day that Jesus became his friend, and he's got a book out about it. It's called I Saw Heaven. So, Roberts, that was one of your supernatural encounters with the Lord. What happened at age Twelve and a half. Well, when I was twelve and a half, I had my second encounter with Christ, where I was at my home, where I lived in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I was watching television. I was watching a TV show at that time that was called The Vernon Shirley. It was the show that was on TV, and Jesus walked through the front door of my house, and without opening the door, and walked toward me where I was sitting there on the sofa in the living room at my home in Tulsa. And as he walked toward me, all of a sudden the room seemed to move back about five, 600 yards where you could hear like the TV in the distance. And the Lord said to me, I want you to study the lives of my generals, know why they succeeded and why some failed, because there will come a generation who will need to know the things that I will teach you if you will be faithful to do what I've asked you this day. And he said a few more things, but we finished, and he turned around and walked back out the front door without opening it, and I went back to watching TV without much reaction. <laughs> now, I know that some people think, well, why wouldn't you react? Well, I was 12 years old. Little mm-hmm. boys act like little boys. But what he meant to me, and I'd always like to say this to the listeners, uh, God talks in the language that you understand. One of the great miracles of God is that he speaks 7 billion languages, which means he speaks everybody's personal language. So he knows how to use the words and the examples and the adjectives that you understand so what i understood him to mean was this was to read and study about the lives of different people both men and women throughout history that he chose to lead revivals or to do different types of things for him and read about their lives what they did right if they did something wrong what was it what could we learn from it and to study their lives and to prepare for the great revival of the great youth evangelist and the move of God that was coming in the future. And so I began to read biographies about people like John Wesley, Smith Wigglesworth, Catherine Kuhlman, uh, William and Catherine Booth, um, Hudson Taylor. Uh, You know, the list goes on and on and on. And to study their lives, read their books, and I would read things that were for them and things that were against them. And to study what uh, other people said about them, and then it's People like, say, Or Roberts or Sister Amy McPherson, I would find folks that knew them and go interview them, what they remembered, what was, what were they like, what could we learn from them. And so I began to interview a lot of old people when I was a young kid. And so that's how I began to obey that second visitation of the Lord, just to the lives of my generals, know why they succeeded and why they failed. And I've written about five books so far on that subject, and there'll be 12 big books when I finish the series called God's Generals. So name the titles of the books you've written so far. Well, the the, the brand title is called God's Generals, and the first one's called Why They Succeeded and Why Some Failed. Then it's the second one's called The Roaring Reformers, where we talk about Martin Luther, John Knox, John Whitecliffe, uh, John Huss, different ones like that. The third one is called The Revivalist, where we preach uh, or talk about uh, Peter Cartwright, the pistol-toting preacher, John and Charles Wesley, George Whitfield, Charles Finney, D.L. Moody, uh, some of those type of people. And then the uh, the next one would be on what we call the Heathen Evangelist, where I talk about Oral Roberts, Lester Summerall. I talk about uh, George Jeffries, the great Elam apostle from England, and F.F. F. Bosworth, and then my good friends Charles and Francis Hunter that were known as the Happy Hunters. <laughs> and so I'm just about to release the next one in September, and it'll be on the great missionaries. And that'll be about Hudson Taylor, uh, David Brainerd, uh, people like that, Jonathan Goforth, Amy Carmichael, uh, people that went to the nations first to take the gospel, David Livingston. So it'll be an exciting book. That next one is going to be very, very exciting. I write about in that one about the great Hawaiian revival, because at one time in Hawaii, it was the world's largest Protestant church in the middle 1800s. It had over 10,000 members in the church in Hawaii. And wow. there is a great revival there. And most people don't know about that great revival. 
in the uh, Hawaiian Islands at one time was called the Sandwich Islands, back before they were annexed into American statehood. And uh, the missionaries begin to show up. And uh, the first African-American single lady missionary was sent out from New England, America, to Hawaii. So that's also another special thing about uh, the Hawaiian revival is they had an African-American lady that was born a slave, had gotten saved, and then was freed and felt called to be a missionary. And so the Missionary Society decided to send Betsy Stockton with the Hawaiian team that went from New England down through South America, around the end of South America, up to Hawaii, and they came to Hawaii and began to preach. Many, many years ago in Hawaii, there had been a prophecy by one of the early chiefs that one day there will come a man with white skin carrying a black box. When you see the black box, receive the box and the man. Well, when the missionary walked off the boat, they had kept their Bibles because of the dampness from the sea in a black box. And when he walked off the boat with the black box in his hand, all the Hawaiians remembered that 300-year-old prophecy. And they believed him, and they received Christ by the thousands, and a revival took off. And so that's how the Christianity came to Hawaii. That's very interesting. I've never heard that before. I didn't know there was a revival, and I hadn't heard that story about her name was Betsy Stockton, you said? Betsy Stockton. Um, she's one of those unknown people that I thought needed to come out and be re- rediscovered. She's one of those people that, now she wasn't a Pentecostal, she was more a Presbyterian type of lady, but they were good Christian people, and they went there and got people saved, and she was born to slave and had gotten saved during her slave years, and really loved Jesus and felt called to be a missionary. And the American Missionary Society was concerned that they were going to put this African-American woman on a boat with all these white missionaries, and would they treat her right? And so the Special Missionary Society wrote up an agreement that everybody had to sign of how they would treat Betsy. And Betsy was equal in ministry, equal as a person, and that her color would not cause her to be second. And they all had to agree to treat her like that. And they signed it, and they treated her right, and she was good. And she went over to Hawaii and taught the gospel, and she built schools for the Hawaiian children to learn English and to be educated, along with some medical help. So she was a very go-getter type of woman when she finished her time in Hawaii. She came back to America, and then she helped build... I think it was the first Episcopal African Episcopal Church in New England. And so she was a very wonderful Christian minister of her own right, and I think she's a great lady that we should all rediscover. And she was in the born in the 1800s? Uh, she was born uh, in the eight, early 1800s and was freed, and then she went over into uh, Hawaii, yes. Wow, she's got an amazing story, that's for sure. We're going to be right back with more from Roberts Lairdon. We're back and we're talking with Roberts Lairdon. And I just want to say how impactful the God's Generals book has been for me next to the Bible. That's my favorite book. And, in fact, I thought I had lost my copy, so I bought another one. And after I got the other one, I found my first copy. But I've just read and reread those stories of the generals in that, and I've been so touched and inspired by their lives. And I also have the big book of the John G. Lake book that you wrote, too, that big, thick oh, one yes. of his yes, um, big, Over a thousand and, pages, yes. Yes, yes, and I love that one. I've marked that up and underlined a lot of things. But wonderful, wonderful books. So two of my favorite generals in your first God's Generals book is mm-hmm. Daddy Seymour, William Seymour, yes. and Mariah Woodworth Etter. And I wondered mm-hmm. if you'd just say a little bit about each of them what their backgrounds were, how they got started in ministry, and how their lives changed history forever. Well, Danny Seymour, uh, he's called that because we look at him as the founder of the modern Pentecostal movement. His name is William Joseph Seymour. His parents were slaves uh, when they were children, and they were freed, and they got married, and they were living in Centerville, Louisiana. And they had a little boy whose name was William Seymour. And William Seymour, uh, as a child, had gotten smallpox and had scars on his face. And his left eye was what we call legally blind. And so he uh, loved Jesus, 
and got involved in Christianity, and he ended up at Charles, Par Charles Parma's Bible School in Houston, Texas, at the turn of the 1900s, and where the Holy Spirit had been poured out, and Brother Parma was preaching that the Holy Spirit is alive today, and that everything in the book of Acts is here today, including speaking in tongues, and healing, and deliverance, and visions, and dreams, and all these wonderful things. And so he wanted to go to that Bible school. And because he was an African-American man, there in those days in America, it was the Jim Crow laws. And they wouldn't allow black people and white people to be together. So they had to leave the door of the classroom open, and Seymour would sit outside in the hallway and hear the lectures. And so he graduated with all the students, and he was the first student to be uh, asked to preach at, gradu at the end of graduation. And he was asked to preach in California. And so he didn't have the money to get there. So all the students and the teachers took up an offering and helped him buy his train ticket from Houston to L.A. And he gets out to L.A. to preach at a Nazarene church the first night, and they didn't like him and closed the doors. But there was a couple that liked him, and he went to the house and had a home meeting, and a revival broke out that moved from the house to 312 Azusa Street, where mm -hmm. for three and a half years, the Pentecostal revival went on night and day, there was always services going on, and the great Holy Spirit was being poured out and filling people up with the gifts and speaking in tongues. And God chose a little black man in the time in America where the African Americans were looked down upon, and God was restoring the Holy Spirit as well as making a cultural statement saying, I will use who I want to use, even an African American guy, so take that. And so the modern, the modern pastor of the Pentecostal movement was William Seymour. So today, all over the world, the largest Protestant group of Christians are the spirit-filled or the tongue-talking people. The only group of Christians bigger than them are the Catholics. And I always say, give us another 100 years and we'll be bigger than the Catholics. <laughs> and so Daddy Seymour was the man that God chose to help birth the restoration of the Holy Spirit's infilling with all the gifts and the graces. And it was a beautiful story that God chose an outcast to be the in cast and to lead the movement. I think that that's so wonderful that God used him to really make that statement because even when Jesus was here on earth, there were traditional things and cultural things that, you know, weren't right and he didn't agree with, but he didn't, you know, go on a crusade to try and change them or have a protest, but he just did it. He healed the lepers well, and he, he treated the yeah. He treated the women, ahead. you know, as equals and et cetera. He did what he was called to do, and he won. We win over battles with nature and culture and demonic forces by obeying the word and obeying our call. We don't have to get into fights and arguments, and Seymour portrays that very beautifully. He was not a fighter. He just obeyed, and God used him to do tremendous things. Now talk a little bit about Mariah Woodworth Edder. Well, Mother Edder, as we all called her, uh, was born in 1844 in New uh, Lisbon, Ohio. She married a Civil War veteran, and so they tried to be the typical Americans at that time, which in those days most of America was agricultural farming people. And so they had six children, and five of her children died, but one daughter was the only one left alive. The farming didn't go well, so finally she thought the Lord had talked to her when she was young about being in ministry. But she thought the Lord had made a mistake because she was a woman. And so the Lord kept dealing with her. And finally, she accepted the call of God and her husband and her decided to go toward ministry. So she sought ordination through a ministerial group in Ohio who really didn't like women preachers. But because Mother Edda was persistent, they ordained her and assigned her one of the worst places in Ohio, hoping that she'd go there, get discouraged, quit, and leave her alone. And then they called it the Devil's Den. And the reason why they called this place in Ohio the Devil's Den because every preacher they'd sent there had failed, and the devil seemed to have won. So they thought, well, we're going to send Mother Edder, and she'll just quit and give up, and we'll get rid of this pesty woman. Well, they didn't know that a woman preacher would be a big draw for the people, because back then women didn't preach. That was a man's job. And uh, so people came just to see the oddity of a woman preacher. Well, a revival broke out, and when everything was said and done, she would built a church with 200 new converts, 200 new converts and a Sunday school, and she broke the back of the devil's den. And the group of people that had ordained her, I have to give them credit, 
because what they did was they recognized they made a mistake. They saw the woman's fruit. They got behind her and supported her, and she became the number one church planner in that group. Her ministry would grow to sometimes of crowds of 25,000 people, and she would have the gifts of the Spirit speaking in tongues with healings and deliverances, and while she'd be preaching sometimes, people would fall into trances. Now, Peter in the book of Acts fell into a trance, and the Lord gave him a vision. And a lot of people, children, men, women, sinners, and Christians, when she'd be preaching or having her meetings, the Spirit of God would fall on different ones, and they would go out into a trance and see heaven or hell or have a vision of Jesus or an angel and come back and tell about what happened. And God gloriously saved and passionately renewed. And so Mother Edder's ministry exploded like that across America. And she joined the Pentecostal movement as the grandmother of the movement. She'd help train F.F. F. Bosworth, help birth the Assemblies of God. She was a great, great woman that lived right, and she had good doctrines, and she preached well, and she died in faith, not having any scandals in her life. So may we say praise God for Mother Edder. Amen. And both of them, their ministries were, were different in a lot of ways but they both changed history forever. They did. Well, Brother Seymour helped birth the Pentecostal movement, and Mother Edder helped birth uh, the ability of women in ministry and the move of the Holy Spirit. And, you know, you can criticize somebody, but when God does miracles through them, it kind of settles the issue that God doesn't have a problem with him being black and her being a woman. And so at the end of the day, they were pioneers for the African-American community to break down racism and to break down gender barriers. And we're so glad they obey because we're living in the fruit of that today throughout America and the world. Amen. Well, stay tuned. We'll be back with more from Roberts Lairdon. I'm so excited. We're talking with Roberts Lairdon today, and Roberts has been sharing about some of the books that he's written. And Roberts, how many books have you written to date? Well, at this time I've written about 66 books. Now, some are big and some are small, so I don't want everybody to think they're all 500 pages. Some are about, you know, 30, 40 pages, and then some are over 1,000 pages. So I write from big books to little books, but 66 books so far. I'm trying to to uh, write over 100 before I get to go to heaven. And you're an avid reader, so you started out studying the people's lives that you were going to write about, the God's generals, but you right. read how many books through your lifetime? My my librarian tells me I've read approximately about 14,000 books. That's probably why I wear glasses. My eyes are tired. So <laughs> I started reading when I was a little boy, when I was 12 years old. And so I started, I always joke, I started reading books with no pictures in them. So that's why when I write a book, I put pictures in all my books because I think there should be pictures in books. So... Um, I'm so happy that God's blessed my my writing and my books around the world. They're in 50, almost 60 languages now. And so we're very happy that God's breathed blessings on it. And I'm so happy that people are blessed by the books. Because when you write a book, you pray that you did it right, and it'll bless people. And then when you start hearing reports about them and how they've done the the, the blessing, I'm thinking, praise God, we hit bullseye. So tell us about three of the most recent books that you've written. What's the, well, the I've written, title? I've written uh, a book that's kind of a fun title called Haunted Houses, Ghosts, and Demons, What You Can Do About Them Besides Run From Them. And uh, I know that's kind of a wild title maybe for some of our listeners, but let me explain what it's about and why I wrote the book. I lived four and a half years uh, in England about two years ago. It's when I returned back to America after my time in London. And when I came back to America, I noticed that on our televisions at prime time we had psychics on there reading people's you know futures and stuff we had uh ghost hunters which was a tv show where they had a tv crew hunting uh, for demons or ghosts in haunted houses and we had all types of walking dead we had all types of you know the satanic world out there the dark side and i asked some of my pastor friends are you teaching on demonology not to make people afraid but to tell them they have power over the devil and just to be aware to keep these things out of their life and to live more in the light than in the darkness. And the pastors would go, oh, we can't talk about that because if we do, they'll get scared and leave the church. And I thought to myself, well, in America, after dinner, while they're all drinking their cup of coffee, they're watching all these demonic shows. And so that's why I wrote this book to explain where Lucifer came from, what demons are, what they do, what they did in the Bible, the Old Testament, and the New, and your power over the devil 
in Jesus so you don't have to be afraid and you can be a deliverer and a confronter of darkness and make it bow and and go under your feet. So that is one of my new books I just released about two months ago. And then I wrote another teaching book on the power of praying in the unknown tongue or power, uh, power of speaking in tongues. And so I talk about that tongues is for today, what the Bible says about it, what Paul talked about it, and how to receive it, diversity of tongues, and the benefits of praying in tongues every day along with your natural earth language, whether it be English or Spanish or whatever it may be. And so, and then I've got my uh, God's Generals for Kids books. i got six volumes of that where I'm writing kids books with the general stories from the ages of 8 to 12. So kids that are from age of 8 to 12 can read about Captain Kuhlman or Wigglesworth or John Alexander Dowie or Evan Roberts and Mother Edder and hear their story in the uh, age level of 8 to 12, which we're very excited because we're getting all types of great reports where kids are speaking in tongues and they're having visions of heaven and, and they're feeling the call of God. So those books are working to minister to a wonderful new group of leaders coming up in a future generation. I think that's wonderful that you're starting the kids out so young to start them in that direction because sometimes you think, oh, they'll when they're a teenager, they can be in a youth group, but starting them at a young age is important. Yeah, I think um, American kids, I know this broadcast goes all over the world, but I would say with using our children, a lot of them watch cartoons and they look at sports stars or uh, singers or movie stars, and I thought, well, that's okay, I'm not against that, but I wanted them to have another more wholesome and more spiritual Christian heroes. And so I took the general's book and put them into their language so they can have Captain Kuhlman in the midst of all of their other heroes and all their other people they're looking at, and they can have a Wigglesworth to be uh, an influence on their life. So I'm really happy that God's blessing those books for kids. And you also have a video series on YouTube about your God's generals. Yes, if you go to my YouTube channel called Robert's Alert and Ministries, you can see all the TV shows and my DVDs where I talk about all of these great generals or great Christian leaders, and I put the pictures and if there's voice recordings, I put voice recordings or there's film footage. Like if you go and watch the one on Captain Kuhlman, you'll get to see Captain Kuhlman in a miracle service or the film footage of Wigglesworth or, you know, there's film footage of Mother Edda, your favorite. Uh, there's no voice of her, but at least I've got mm-hmm. 35 seconds of Mother Edda walking in front of her house on old silent film. So we tell their stories and put their pictures and if uh, we, we try to make them come alive to inspire a new generation. And tell us about your God TV program that's on, on Sunday mornings. Well, the Lord told me about a year ago to go on television. I thought, well, Lord, that takes some money, and I'm going to need a miracle to do that. And then God TV, based out of England, which is airing in over 220 countries now, uh, asked me would I like to go on, and they made a deal where I could afford it. And so every Sunday morning around the world at 930 on Sunday morning on God TV, I come on the air and I have what I call God's Signals with Robert Slayer, where I teach the revival history and the revival stories and the Bible stories about moves of God. So people can watch it if they get it in their country, or they can go online, godtv.com, and look it up as well and watch it on demand. And so we're very excited about that, and we'll probably be doing some other TV networks in the future. But right now, we're on God TV, airing that and inspiring a new generation of revivalists. So Robert In your lifetime, you've established churches and Bible schools, embassy, Christian center, and right now your international headquarters is in Sarasota, and you've got an extension office in London, England. Is there any place else in the world that God's been laying on your heart in particular to spread the gospel? Well, I go every year to Asia. I try. um, I I built 40 churches in my life, and when I lived in California, and then I moved to, to Florida because the Lord told me when I was a little boy I lived the first half of my life on the West Coast and the last half on the East Coast. But then I travel all over the time. So I go every year to Europe and preach, East and Western Europe. And then I go to every year I go to Asia because there's a great move of God starting to happen in Asia. You've got a great, uh, of course, the great Korean revival uh, in South Korea. You've got the Philippines uh, with the only Christian nation in all of Asia. It declares itself a Christian nation. Singapore is exploding with great Christian revival. And Taiwan is not far behind. Taiwan is beginning to boom with the gospel. And so Asia is about to explode, I think, with a great revival, and I want to be a part of it. So I go over and preach in all the churches that will have me in the Bible schools, 
and uh, do TV and radio over there as well. And so we're very excited about that part of the world. Now, Africa, I go when I can. I love Africa. I've been going there since I was 16 years old. The first place I went as a young boy between my junior and senior year of high school was to Uganda, and then I went down to Zimbabwe and Mozambique and South Africa, and so we've been going to Africa for years. But there's a revival already in Africa, so I try to go places where it's kind of tough and help push it along sometimes. To kind of break it open with that breaker anointing. Yeah, and, get in there and, and, have, and I preach real strong and pray out loud and jump in the altar and help break, have a breakthrough. I like doing that. Amen. Well, you continue to to have a really demanding speaking schedule along with writing your books, and then you're also mentoring a new generation of world leaders uh, that are affecting the church and society. And first okay. I want to ask you, what would you say to the up-and-coming leaders and the, the new generation that's coming up? What would be something you would just want to leave with them? Well, I would say, number one, you have to know who you are in Christ uh, before you become, you can become great in your job for Christ. Uh, one of the great things I learned about studying the great preachers, the great generals, is a lot of times people understood their gifting, but they did not understand who they were in Christ first. So you are a child, of, a child of God because you're born again. You're made righteous through Jesus Christ. Having those foundations give you the security to survive persecution, to survive uh, backlash and, and people's negative things, as well as to stay humble in the midst of great success. So I would say, uh, one thing I always taught my Bible school students, I said, go through the New Testament, and every place you find where it says, in him or in, the, uh, in whom, where it talks about who you are in Christ, underline that verse and meditate on it, and build your inner person, because out of knowing who you are will come what you do for Christ. And I want everybody listening to be able to finish their whole life successfully. When we make mistakes, but we want to try to make them small and make them few, not large and many. And so by putting the word in you effectively and consciously, that will give you the ability to overcome certain things that the devil throws at you and at times when you're tired, the devil tries to trap you. And so that will be one. And I also want to talk to uh, the, the young ladies and the women in ministry. I'm very strong that God calls women. Peter said in Acts chapter 3 and Acts chapter 2 that in the last days that God will touch men and women, both young and old. So we got two groups there that has been marginalized. One has been the women and the other has been young people. Young people can obey God while they're young and do great things. I built my first mega church when I was 26 years old. I wrote a first national bestseller when I was 17. And so I'm 48, and I've been in ministry over 30 years. So I've been doing this my whole life. So I know you can succeed while you're a teenager and in your 20s if you'll mature your spirit and watch your soul and watch your friends and stay around stable, strong people and run from stupid people and run <laughs> from wrong people. I know that's kind of raw, but that's the language I think will help everybody get my point. And for women... I want women to know that God calls men and he calls women. And in the last days, women are going to prophesy, they're going to speak, they're going to obey. A woman can do anything a man can do if God told them to do it. So I would encourage the women to not feel second class or be uh, put down, but to stand up. And I would advise this. If you're a part of a Christian group that does not believe in women preachers and you feel like you've got a call of God, then I would politely leave that group and go join one that believes that women can obey and carry an anointing. And I always tell folks I would join a Pentecostal charismatic church because normally that particular group of Christians believes that women are going to be used greatly in the last days, and they support them, they pray for them, and they don't persecute them like other groups do. So I don't want to cause uh, division, but I'm going to be very clear. There are probably thousands of women that are called of God, that feel like they can't do it because someone said women can't preach. Well, when you study that women can't preach, Paul mainly was addressing a group of women that were out of order, not all women. And I know we don't have time to talk about that, but for some reason that comes up in my spirit today that there are women watching, that are listening to us, there are young teenagers that feel called of God, and I want you to know that God has anointed you, God's called you, it's not a mistake, you are on time, and I'm going to pray that God will put the right people in your path and that the wrong people get out of your life. And so those are a few things I'd like to share to those that are, that are listening and not to, to feel down but to be big on the inside and pray in tongues and pray in English or pray in your native language every day out loud. Confess the word and bind the devil even if you don't feel he's around us. Let him know he cannot have anything to do with you as a part of your daily devotion.
Roberts, where can people connect with you? You said that on YouTube, your YouTube channel is Roberts Lairdon Ministries. Ministries. You can go to my website, which is www.roberts with an S, Lairdon, and it's spelled L I A R D O N dot com. And, uh, or you can call my offices in uh, London or in uh, Sarasota, Florida. Or you can write me a letter or you can email me. There's half a million ways. You can follow me on Twitter and Facebook. My Facebook page is called Robert Laird and Official because sometimes folks try to hijack my name, but it's the official one that's, uh, that's the real one out there. So you can get me in all those ways. Well, Robert, it's been such an honor and privilege to have you on Overcomers International today. Thank you so much for sharing. Well, thank you for having me. I hope we can do this again, and I hope that everybody was blessed by the broadcast today. God bless you. Thank you.